Hello there, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at something really important for your journey into astrophotography. It's tracking down the right telescope. And there's a number of things you need to consider here. So I'm going to go through everything. So strap yourself in, grab a tea, coffee, beer, wine, and let's get into it. As you probably discovered by now, there's a mind-boggling array of different types of telescopes to choose from. There's refractors, also known as fracs, including achromats, LED doublets and apochromatic triplets. There's Newtonian reflectors, aka newts, I think they're called. Smith cast grain, aka SETs, Richard Kretchen's, aka RCs, Roe Aikman's, Asgraphs, Rassers, Max Tuff cast grains, aka Max, uh, uh, Classical cast grains, Max Tuff, Newtonians, Kretchen Dal Kirkham, the list kind of goes on really. You get the idea. Now, can we quickly exclude some of these by considering the following? Reconsider focal length, focal ratio, optical quality, weight, focus quality, cost, maintenance, and what's included. I think we can narrow things down way further and we'll also discover what makes for a good and easy to use deep sky imaging telescope in the first place. Focal length is the distance from the prime mirror or lens to where the image is formed. If we take for example an image of the Great Orion Nebula with both a long and short focal length telescope, the nebula will appear large in a narrow field of view with the long focal length telescope and small in a large field of view with the short focal length telescope. I should probably add this is for a given sensor size. The long focal length image showing a large nebula in a narrow field of view will reveal tracking errors more easily and this is because the image is effectively more magnified so small errors look larger, therefore it's harder to accurately track the sky at longer focal lengths. So I would wholeheartedly recommend starting out deep sky imaging with a shorter focal length telescope. A good analogy for visualising the importance of this would be to, if you hold out a stick at arm's length, you'll notice it's really hard to keep the end of the stick still, but if you hold out just your arm, it's much easier to keep the end of your arm still. Focal ratio, or F ratio for short, is the telescope's focal length divided by its aperture. An F ratio of F5 would be considered optically fast, whilst an F ratio of say 10 would be considered optically slow, and this is to do with how fast and slow the light enters the telescope. I'll explain this with an example. If we take two telescopes, both with a focal length of 500mm and one has an aperture of 50mm, making it an f10, and the other has an aperture of 100mm, making it an f5, it stands to reason that the 100mm f5 telescope will be letting in a lot more light for a given amount of time, just like how a larger bucket would collect more raindrops compared to a smaller bucket. The focal lengths are the same, so the image will appear to be the same size in the same field of view only the 100mm image will be much brighter because of all these extra photons that are being collected. So let's summarise both focal length and focal ratio. A short focal length telescope lets you accurately track the sky more easily, and if it also has a fast focal ratio by having more aperture, it helps you to collect more light in less amount of time so you don't need to track the sky for as long to get a good image. So I hope you can see that having both a short focal length and a fast focal ratio makes life easier for deep sky astrophotography. Out of our long list of telescope types, there are only three which commonly have a short focal length and a fast focal ratio, and these are refractors, Newtonians, and the RASA. Let's move on to optical quality and see if we can narrow things down even further. Refractors we can split into three main categories, achromats, ED doublets, and apochromatic triplets. Achromats are the, you know, the classic long, thin tube on a tripod that everyone kind of thinks of. Most commonly these have a doublet lens made out of crown and flint glass. I think it's the frown offer design. And this does a good job of bringing two out of the three primary wavelengths of light to the same focus. In fact, the reason they used to make them long and thin is so they could use lenses with more gentle curves. This bends the light more gently, open to approximately focus all the wavelengths of light in the same place, reducing chromatic aberration. They are great for visual work such as planets and the moon and double stars, but because they're optically very slow, they're not really suitable for deep sky imaging. They do make shorter, faster achromats like my 4-inch F5, but these are only really meant for low-power wide field observing. If you pump up the magnification or attach a camera to it, you'll see bloated purple stars known as chromatic aberration. And this is from the telescope's inability to focus all wavelengths at the same point. 
For imaging, the two other types of refractor are much better. ED doublets have two lenses like Acromats, but the glass is more exotic and has a higher refractive index, allowing it to bend the third wavelength of light closer to being in line with the other two. ED refractors cost more money than Acromats because of the exotic glass used to make them, but they're usually cheaper than apochromatic triplets, so they tend to be the most commonly used refractors when starting out imaging. They don't totally get rid of chromatic aberration, but they come very close at a reasonable price, and because they have two elements instead of three, they cool and acclimatise ready for imaging a bit more quickly. Triplet apochromats, or apos for short, use a lens for each of the primary wavelengths of light, so they're able to focus all light at the same point. As a result, they show virtually no or none chromatic aberration whatsoever, no purple fringing and tack sharp stars. Actually, some ED doublets will show tack sharp stars visually, just that apos can give tack sharp stars on long exposures with a camera, which is the, the key thing here. Triplet apos are generally more expensive, a bit heavier, and take a bit longer to cool for imaging. So with this in mind, the ED doublet is the one type of refractor I'd recommend for beginners. As with refractors, you can get various types of Newtonian telescope, including the Smith or Matstoff Newtonians. These are really good for imaging because they reduce some of the optical aberrations found for classical Newtonians, such as coma, because they've got a corrector plate at the front that corrects for those things. However, they are much less common and a fair bit heavier and more expensive. Plus, you need an effective way of controlling the dew which can form on the corrector plate right at the front of the telescope. Because you can get the benefits of a Smith or Matstoff Newtonian by adding a lightweight coma corrector to the focus of a much cheaper lighter classical Newtonian, I'm only going to recommend a classical Newtonian to the beginner astrophotographer. Specifically, I'm only going to recommend an F5 Newtonian reflector because anything faster like an F4 is just too tricky to collimate and to keep that collimation in place. But with an F5, it's much, much easier, even though it's only one f-stop higher. The, the sweet spot for collimation is so much bigger that it, it maintains collimation throughout temperature changes. You get the idea, it's just easier, basically. Just for those that don't know, collimation is the process of aligning the optical elements to get the best image you can. I wouldn't recommend a slower Newtonian than F5 either, because they quickly get big and unwieldy and have a large surface area for catching the wind. Also, the focal length increases, making accurate tracking more challenging. Because Newtonians use mirrors to reflect, and the incoming light doesn't pass through the mirrors, the light, for the lack of a better word, remains intact, and you don't get the splitting apart of colours like you get with an achromatic refractor. This means that even cheap reflectors can match the most expensive triplet refractors in terms of controlling chromatic aberration. Other aspects such as contrast are not quite as good with a Newtonian, and you do get diffraction spikes and bright stars caused by the spider veins which hold the secondary mirror in place. But the affordable cost of a fast telescope with zero chromatic aberration makes a Newtonian a very good choice for imaging on a budget. The Rasper is quite a recent optical design, and it's made specifically for wide field deep sky imaging. In fact, you can't use these at all for visual astronomy as the camera attaches to the front where the light goes in. They are incredibly optically fast at f2 as well, and have a flat field free from coma, curvature and chromatic aberration over quite a large area. So they give lovely round stars using most camera sensors up to APS-C size, which is a common sensor size on DSLR and mirrorless cameras. However, these telescopes do start at around £2,000 or dollars for the 8-inch model, so for these reasons I can't recommend it for a beginner. So far this leaves us with ED doublet refractors and F5 Newtonians. If we go back to our list of considerations, we've touched on weight already, but you can get both refractors and Newtonians which are light enough for deep sky imaging but this is highly dependent on what mount you plan to use with it. Telescopes commonly have either a 1.25 or a 2 inch focuser, but there is a lot more to them than just that. So what should we look for in a focuser suitable for imaging? Well, we want it to be able to reach focus with a camera, we want it to be large enough to allow all the light through the camera sensor so you don't get something called vignetting, which is kind of like darkening around the edges of the frame and we want it to be strong so it doesn't slip and sag under the load of a camera as well. Also, because classical Newtonians suffer from coma and refractors suffer from field curvature. We want a focuser that's large enough to take a coma corrector or field flattener, and these are commonly in the 2 inch fitting size. These things are really tricky to achieve on a budget, which is why some people spend more on a third-party focuser than others do on an entire telescope. Our best bet for an off-the-shelf telescope is to opt for one with at least a 2-inch focuser, and preferably one that's dual speed. 
a dual speed focuser is always going to add a little bit more cost so on a tight budget we certainly can get by with a cheap focus mask and a single speed focuser. DIYing a larger focuser knob can always help make things less fiddly as well. Personally I wouldn't spend a huge amount of money on your first imaging telescope because like with any hobby you might just find it's not for you and you might prefer golf or something. However cost is subjective and there's those that won't bat an eyelid at spending 2k on a RASA. A budget of around 500 pounds, dollars, euros, earth tokens seems realistic because any new imager will also need to allow money to buy a suitable equatorial tracking mount and possibly even a camera if they don't have one lying around the house like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. So we're looking at ED doublet refractors and F5 classic Newtonians and they need to be light, affordable and have at least a 2 inch focuser capable of reaching focus with a camera. I won't choose telescopes solely for my usual horn, first light optics in the UK. I have affiliate links with them so it might kind of look like I'm being a bit biased. So with that in mind and in the interest of re representing all corners of the rectangle earth, I've chosen the following retailers to look at telescopes and go window shopping. High Point Scientific in the US. Bintel in Australia, Telescope Service in Germany, and of course, First Light Optics in the UK. Affiliate links below. Manufactured by Zhensheng Optical, or otherwise known as GSO, in China, the 6 inch Apertura has a 750mm focal length, which is the longest out of all the scopes I've chosen today. However, it's still short enough to not cause too many tracking worries for medium duty mounts. Also, 750mm is quite handy for a little bit of image scale on some of the larger galaxies and smaller nebulae, although the field of view is a little too narrow for objects like Andromeda when using a typical DSLR or mirrorless camera, which most people start out with. It's perfect for framing the Rosette Nebula though, as I found back in 2012 when I imaged this at 750mm focal length with a hot pixel riddled modded Canon 50D. The scope has a fast f5 focal ratio so great for collecting plenty of data in a short space of time. It has a 2 inch Crayford focuser which is optimised for reaching focus with a camera so I think an extension tube would be needed to gain enough back focus for any visual work that you wanted to do. There are no extras to buy such as a finder or finder shoe, it's all there ready to help you align your scope and find your objects ready for imaging. By its very nature, a 6 inch Newtonian has a fair bit more surface area for catching the wind compared to say a small imaging refractor, so maybe not the best scope for a windy exposure location, but it's fairly light at 10 pounds or 4.5 kilograms considering its size. As mentioned earlier, there are diffraction spikes on Newtonians, but no chromatic aberration, and you occasionally need to align the mirrors with a few tweaks of the primary mirror screws, but that's easy and quick to learn. The main summary is it's a good all-round telescope for not much money. Just add a coma corrector for another, say, £120 or dollars, and you've got yourself a nice flat field of round stars right to the edge of the picture that you take. Next, let's head over to Bintel in Australia for more window shopping. Anyone who watches Dylan's channel or lives in Australia will know this one for sure. I had a good old search on Bintel and found this Evo Looks by Skywatcher. They look like they're about to be launched pretty soon, so perfect for 2021. I remember there was quite a bit of talk about these on Stargazer's Lounge before you know what happened. They look like the replacement for the Skywatcher's old Equinox line of ED refractors and if that's the case, spec-wise they'll sit somewhere between the Evo, Evo Star ED Pros and the Esprit Triplet Apos. I was quite tempted to choose something like a William Optic Zenith Star 61, but I do like the look of the Evo Luxes. It has a slightly larger 2.4 inch focuser and the dovetail is pointing in the correct way to offset any weight of a camera hanging off the back of it. Also looking at conversion rates, I think it will undercut the WO61 price wise as well. It might also be the perfect partner for the Skywatcher Star Adventure mount, which is a star tracker I very much recommend for beginners starting out in astrophotography. The scope only weighs about 5.5 pounds or 2.5 kilograms, and its focal length is tracking friendly 400 millimeters, or only 360 millimeters with the dedicated reducer flattener. So yeah, it should be a good match for the Star Adventure mount. The tiny Evo looks would be way better in a windy location also compared to the 6 inch Newtonian we looked at, and that would be too large to use on a star tracker anyway, even still conditions. Now let's head over to telescope service in Germany. Searching around the site I almost settled on the TS 70mm f6 ED refractor, however the 80mm f7 looks like a much more complete package with proper tube rings and a dovetail bar for balancing. The focus looks great on this one also, it's a 2.5 inch dual speed rack and pinion focuser, so pretty big and the focus shouldn't slip like it can with some cheaper Crayford focuses. 
It comes with a finder shoe ready to accept finder or guide scope also. I'm fairly sure TS and Altair Astro used to sell something similar to these, an 80mm F7 or was it 100 and F7? It was around this price bracket anyway, and classed as semi-apo, meaning the colour correction was somewhere between an acromat and an apochromat. But the blurb on the TS site does now say this scope has very well corrected ED optics, so maybe they've improved the glass type. Anyway, it uses Japanese ED glass and at F7 it should be fairly kind on optics anyway, so I would honestly take a punt on one of these for the build quality per price alone. In fact, I'm considering getting the 102 F7 version for my observatory at some point in the future. Spec-wise, the focal length is 560mm and it's light at just 2.8kg or 6 pounds. There's a 0.8 reducer flattener available which will take it down to a fast F5.6 at 450mm, so wide enough for that compulsory Andromeda shot. Now back to Blighter to visit First Light Optics affiliate links below. I've probably spent a significant portion of my life window shopping on the First Light Optics site, so I knew exactly which two remaining scopes to head for. First, the most affordable scope on the list, the Pocket Newtonian Powerhouse, which is the Skywatch 130 PDS. If you're on a tight budget, you could do so much worse than to buy this for just £179, and it even comes with a 2-inch eyepiece in that price as well. I've owned a couple of these, or is it 3, 4, 5? I've owned a few. I always seem to sell them thinking the grass is greener and then totally regret it. It has all the advantages of the Epitura 6 inch Newtonium from High Point Scientific but it's even smaller, lighter, it's got a slightly shorter focal length. There is also a lengthy thread on Stargazer's Lounge devoted to imaging with this telescope so it's attracted almost a cool following really. It weighs 4kg so technically it's within the payload capacity of the Star Adventure Man but I'm not sure anyone's ever attempted that. It has a native focal length of 650mm at f5 and if you add a coma corrector you'll have a fully fledged astrograph for under £300 which is, you know, pretty remarkable really. You just need to be comfortable with tweaking collimation, aka the primary mirror alignment from time to time just to keep the optics 100%. Last but not least, the Skywatch ED72 refractor. This is the most affordable ED refractor on the list and even comes with an Ali flight case with room for other accessories. The ED72 is one of two recent additions to the Skywatch EVOSTAR ED family of scopes, the other being the massive ED150, and with these recent additions Skywatch controversially decided to change the glass type from the well respected FPL53 glass, with its very good refractive index close to that of fluorite used in high end refractors like Takahashi, to an undisclosed glass type and this caused a bit of concern initially because they wouldn't disclose what this glass type was. Thankfully the reviews look really reassuring for the ED72, so the affordable price doesn't mean that they've lowered the quality of the optics, or if they have it's, it's insignificant. Spec wise it weighs just shy of 2kg or 4.4 pounds, it has a 2 inch dual speed Crayford focuser, a native focal length of 420mm at f5.8, so fairly wide and fast natively, tube rings and a dovetail for adjusting balance, there's a finder shoe present for adding a finder or mini guider, and there's a dedicated 0.85 reducer flattener available, which takes this scope down to an even wider and faster 357mm at f4.9. What a bonkers little scope. Anyway, that concludes this video. If you found this helpful at all, please consider giving me a like, and if you want to see more astronomy content from me, consider subscribing and hitting that bell. I have affiliate links below for First Light Optics. It costs no extra to use these links, but I get 5% commission, which I can then buy equipment to review for this channel. Flow deliver internationally, and I have total confidence in them. I've used them for many years. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to tell them clouds to sod off, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye for now.